Good morning, everybody. Welcome to UCLA and welcome to the Longevity Center open house. Thank you all for, for coming today. We have folks that are Zooming in right now. So I'm just allowing a little more time for people to, to come in on Zoom. And we're gonna get our program going in, in a second. So be right with you. Okay, it looks like we have most folks already in here. So let's, let's get started. And again, thank you for being here. And um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Longevity Center today, about our programs. And uh, we'll have a couple people speaking. I'm Linda Erkeley, so I'm the current director of the UCLA Longevity Center. And then Andy Talakowski, who's here today, will also be telling you about some of our programs. So just to give you some background, or let me see if anybody here has, attends any of our programs already. Any, okay, great, okay, good. So we have some new some newcomers. All right, fantastic. So we're gonna have some time for Q and A uh, at the end. I'm gonna talk for about 25, 30 minutes and we'll have some time for Q and A. And then Andy is going to talk a little bit more about our programs. So the, um, the Longevity Center has been around since at least 1991. We used to be called the Center on Aging, but now we're called the UCLA Longevity Center. And uh, our motto is really helping people live better, longer lives. And this is achieved through lifelong education, uh, research, and uh, patient care, and effective community service. So we've been focusing pretty heavily on community education through our programs. And I'm going to talk about those today in, in some detail. So uh, essentially, I'm, um, I'm a neuropsychologist and a clinical psychologist in the field of aging. I've been here at UCLA for about 27 years. And I've worked pretty much in the whole gamut of what there is to do here from education and training to, I still see patients uh, primarily doing cognitive assessments and helping in the diagnosis of cognitive disorders and have worked uh, with a number of the investigators here over the years. So I came to the Longevity Center. I've been involved with the Longevity Center since about 2003 in developing um, a number of its memory programs with Gary Small who was our 20-year um, our uh, director of the Longevity Center. So Gary retired from UCLA almost two years ago. So I've been um, trying to fill a very big pair of shoes for that time. And you can probably guess that my feet are small, but I'm, I'm doing the best that I can and really happy to be bringing you um, some new programs as well, which you'll learn about today. So in a nutshell, these are the programs that we offer. So some of them you may have heard like our Senior Scholars Program, which is our flagship program. We do memory training and, and uh, similar programs in the community like Brain Boot Camps and Sharper Minds. And if you follow us, you'll know that we do about a webinar on average, about a webinar a month, but, but this month has been like, it's been raining webinars. And uh, we have partnerships in the community. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about why lifelong learning? What are the benefits of lifelong learning and the memory training that we do here at the center? Well, an important point is that the world is aging. And uh, the, the population, the percent of people 60 and older is, is climbing. And you can see on this, on this chart, you know, the differences between um, 2000 and projected 2050. And in particularly in the United States, we know that the baby boomers, which was right, the huge cohort of our population have been aging and they're influencing a lot of where we're going in the future and what we need to do for our aging population. So when we talk about successful aging, we're talking about 
aging, your body, your mind, your, your emotions, how they, how they age over time. So how, how is your quality of life over time? It's not just about the length that one lives. It's about the quality of your life as you age. And it involves a number of factors like physical activity, staying healthy and fit, having a healthy diet, doing mental exercise, which doesn't have to be true mental exercises, which we'll talk about, and managing stress. So these are major factors that, that contribute to, besides genetics, right, how well people age. So we know from studies of brain aging, if you look at age along the horizontal axis and cognition, meaning memory, reasoning, how quickly our brains process information in the vertical axis, you see that for many years, what we call normal aging, whatever normal is, because we're still trying to figure that out. But for many years, people don't have any complaints or any problems. And then somewhere in their 40s and 50s, they start to have complaints about their cognitive functioning. Like, I just forgot that word. Or what did I do? I just walked into another room and forgot what I was doing, right? What did I go in there for? Where did I put my keys? Why don't I know that person's name? And et cetera, et cetera. But even then, it doesn't necessarily mean that one's cognition has changed, but it could be stress. It could be you're a little bit thinking a little more slowly. But for many people, there comes a point where their memory and their thinking abilities do decline. And that's called mild cognitive impairment. And that's kind of a gray area because some people with mild cognitive impairment go on to develop Alzheimer's disease or other types of disorders known as dementia. Some people with mild cognitive impairment actually stay in that phase for many years and others revert back and have revert back to their baseline memory functioning. So that's kind of a gray area. We don't always know where that's going for everyone, but we do know that that is an age group or a functional group that we've got to target with lifestyle change, right? To enhance their well-being and quality of life for a lo longer period of time. At some point, the people with mild cognitive impairment who continue to get worse will develop what we call dementia. And dementia is an umbrella term, and it means memory problems, but also problems, serious problems in daily functioning that affects people's ability to live independently. Right, So you can have mild cognitive impairment and things are more difficult, you're not as efficient, but you're still able to live independently. With dementia, things change. You're forgetting to pay your bills, you're forgetting appointments, you're not a safe driver anymore. It just really interferes one's ability to live by themselves right, and function well enough to live alone. But we also know from the research that there are things that you can do, right? Lifestyle changes. So yes, you have to take care of your health. You have to take care of your heart. You have to take care of your brain. And some of this is going to be in partnership with your doctor to do things like lower your blood pressure, lower your cholesterol. But also some of it is what you do in your life to help you have a longer, better life and slow down cognitive decline. So we know from research that if one engages in a healthy lifestyle of education, exercise, and healthy diet, and also reducing emotional stress, that you can actually delay uh, from, we know this from correlational studies, you can delay the onset of dementia in some folks. So this is what we're going for at the Longevity Center, right? We're going for making your life better, number one, just having a better quality of life, feeling good about yourselves as you age, right? And we're also going for what can we help you with 
to help you live better and longer and counteract some of these changes that happen in aging. And, and so what you don't want is too little too late. So quitting smoking once you get lung cancer. Yeah, you need to do that, right? But it's kind of too late. It's, I mean, it's never too late to stop smoking, but it would have been better to quit smoking 10 years earlier, 20 years earlier, right? Or never starting to smoke. So that's what we're talking about. We're trying to head, head decline off at the pass as much as possible. So what we know it, with cognition over the lifespan is there's like two types of cognition. One is called crystallized knowledge. It's the old knowledge stuff that we learn throughout our lives in school. For example, who was Martin Luther King Jr.? That's old knowledge, right? What was the address where you lived as a kid? That's old knowledge. And old knowledge stays pretty stable until people get like into the seventh decade of life. And then it might start to, to deteriorate. But generally, you can look at that as wisdom, right? Um, learned, ever, all the experiences that your learned experiences have brought you in the world. Then on the other side of the coin is what we call fluid intelligence or new knowledge. This is stuff that you learn yesterday. This is new information that you're trying to learn. And it also has to do with how quickly your brain works, the speed at which your brain thinks. So Many people use an analogy of a computer, right? And you know that as your computer gets older, it starts to slow down. Well, so does our computer. And uh, that's from wear and tear, it's from lifestyle, it's from genetics, but that does happen. And it starts happening earlier than uh, the losses of what we call the crystallized abilities. People start slowing down, believe it or not, when they're in their late 20s. I, I hate to break the news to you, but that's probably something that you wouldn't notice in your daily life, but you might notice it when you're 45, right? And how quickly you, you react while you're driving, your reflexes, how fast you can solve a problem, things like that. So we, we know that there are like two different types of mental abilities, some that stay stable for most of people's lives and some that tends to change and be more sensitive to aging. Oh yeah, I wanted to bring up too that um, what's really important are these individual differences. And this is where the rubber meets the road. There is a lot of variability in how people age. In fact, there is as much variability in how people age, how quickly or their degrees of you know, maintenance versus decline as there is variability in child development. So this is something that we can, this is a, a, an age at which we can intervene, right? And try to influence and influence how quickly we age. So the upside of the older brain that I was telling you is wisdom is gained knowledge. And a lot of cultures have really capitalized on this and recognized this. We know that this is true in Native American cultures. It's true in Japanese culture. It's true in many, many cultures across the world. But we seem to have lost some of our respect for our elders in the United States. Now, there are some societies with extreme longevity and the areas of the world where we know people live longer have to are in Okinawa, Japan, in Sardinia, Italy, and right here in Loma Linda, California, which is east of here by about 70 miles or so. And um, some of this appears to have to do with the kinds of lifestyle and, and the types of um, diet and exercise that people engage in. So there tends to be, especially in people in these populations that live to be 100 or more, right? There's a higher percentage than in the general population. They tend to have these things in common, more physical activity in their lives, strong social networks, 
and their diets are rich in antioxidant foods like fruits and vegetables, legumes, healthy grain, grains, and lean protein. We also know from studies here done at UCLA that when we've engaged people, even in a two week healthy lifestyle program where we gave folks some cognitive exercises to do, we put them on a healthy diet, they started to walk. We saw some changes in brain scans where we saw what we, what we interpreted as significant improvement in memory, but also in brain efficiency. So on, on this scan, you see um, the red area and the arrow pointing to this red area. And um, that had to do with the uh, neuronal functioning improving in those regions. We also found in the six week study in an assisted living program as well, some improvement in people's memory functioning by engaging in the six week healthy lifestyle program. We also know from fMRI studies. So these are MRIs that look at the brain while it's thinking, while it's functioning, that we see that neural circuits work hard to compensate for our, we call them senior moments, or to use a, a, a more positive term, a term, our temporary cognitive challenges that we experience as we get older. But we see, okay, that's up in the top, right? You see a lot of red. That means the brain's working hard. But you see on the bottom, two weeks after some brain training, you see that the brain becomes more efficient. It doesn't have to work as hard anymore to do the same task. So we see greater efficiency of brain functioning in a trained brain. We also know that mental stimulation is very good. It's good for the mind, it's good for also emotional well being. And there have been studies done that are what we call longitudinal studies that follow people over time. And we see that for people that engage in, in rich activities, leisure activities, reading, um, socializing, that they tend to have a longer period of good cognitive functioning than people that don't lead those kind of lifestyles. So we can't, we can't do a study where we say, okay, you're gonna be a couch potato for 40 years and you're gonna have a healthy diet, right, for 40 years. We can't do that, but we can follow people. We can get a sense of how they've lived their lives, look at them, especially in midlife, and then try to follow them for 10 to 20 years. And that's, that's what these studies show, that there is a relationship between people that are engaging in a healthy lifestyle in midlife and a better cognitive functioning 20 years later than people that don't lead those kinds of lifestyles. So we also know that educational achievement is protective of the brain. So is bilingualism. It's it, people that have, um, that are bilingual or speak more than two languages have a really good, what we call executive functioning. That's the ability of the brain to switch to like multitask. And what is believed is that people are multitasking a lot because they have to translate, they have to think maybe in two languages. This is going on automatically, right? If you speak Spanish or you speak Mandarin, but you're, you are having to speak English, chances are your brain is constantly going back and forth and, and being very flexible in order to speak in English when maybe the first thing in your mind that comes to mind is in Mandarin, for example. We also know that reading books is tied to a longer life. So again, people were not randomized and say, okay, you go on the book reading lifestyle, you go in the non-book reading lifestyle and we'll follow you for 10 years. No, but what happened in these studies is they did surveys, surveys of people and they asked people how much you read and what do you read? Do you read books? Do you read magazines? Do you read both? And how much do you read? 
And then they followed their, their longevity and looked at death rates over about 12 years. That's the longest they, they were able to follow people. And they found, first of all, that people who read books um, lived uh, about two years longer than people who didn't read. And reading even just 30 minutes a day had a significant survival advantage over non-reading. So they found that reading books was better than reading magazines, but seriously, reading anything is better than not reading. That's what they found. Similarly, they found that conversation improves mental acuity. So they had people engage in conversations and then they did cognitive testing. But there's an important point here is that those conversations should be more on the pleasant side. So if you get into a fight over politics with your good friend, you may have more stress and it may detract from your cognitive processing. But having engaging, pleasant, exhilarating conversations are basically good for your cognitive functioning. And we know that the parts of the brain that seem to get exercised when we're having conversation is really everywhere, right? Because our frontal lobes are involved in reasoning, our language centers are involved in speech production, and our temporal lobes, which are on the side of our head, they're involved in memory recall, learning, processing emotions. And of course, our visual cortex that's back here in the brain is involved in um, uh, reading, but also in processing information from the environment. And then our motor areas and sensory areas, of course, are very engaged in conversation because we're talking with our hands or we're moving our mouth or we're moving our bodies. So it's a whole brain kind of thing. So we also know that if you engage in memory training, so if you take a class and you learn how to form associations or form visual images, that this actually results in changes on brain scans. And we certainly need more of these studies done, but what we see is in the people who need it most, in this particular study that was done in 2003, they looked at older adults who didn't have the best cognitive functioning. All right, they, so they divided their, their adults into, and they had younger adults as well, into those who kind of had suboptimal and those that were doing really great. And what they found was that the people who needed the most boost actually got it from engaging in memory training. The younger adults also showed um, additional gains because they benefit a little bit more than older adults because their brain essentially is more agile. They also so, saw some neurochemical changes in the brain that suggested that this may result in more neuroprotection in the um, memory areas of the brain. And <clears throat> you can see that this is what it sort of looked like you see, again, activation in those frontal areas of the brain. And, um, and that activation in these areas normally decreases as we age. But you can see that in the folks that didn't use the techniques, because they actually went back and they said, okay, what went wrong here? Why didn't everybody show these improvements, right? And they found that the, the reason that some people didn't improve is that they didn't practice and they didn't learn the techniques. So that's another point is not only are these things good for the brain, but you do need to practice them. Just doing them once isn't, isn't gonna benefit. The other, the other important thing and, and really coming from the work that I've done with older individuals is it's really important to have a sense of purpose in life. It really reduces mortality rates, but it enriches life. So, you know, don't roll up your driveway just because you retire, right? But even people who have Alzheimer's disease, they need a sense of purpose. They need to have an enriched life as well. They need activities to do. But the research shows that people who have a greater sense of purpose in life 
also have a lower mortality rate regardless of their age. So in cognitive training, what works? Well, the goal is to support independent living and improve quality of life. That's what the research tries to do. And we know that there are different types of training. There's memory compensation, where you're not going to change your brain, but you sure learn how you sure learn workarounds. Then there's cognitive improvement. Then there's practical aids, like when you write a, a post-it note. And then there's rehabilitation, which I'm not going to talk about, but that's when people have a head injury or they have a stroke and they need to rewire their brains. So the, the research in these areas, and this has been going on, these researches, I would say since the 70s and 80s, shows that a lot of the techniques that we include in our memory training programs actually have shown to be effective in improving people's memory and cognition in these studies. So we teach you visual imaging, forming stories, grouping things together, working on your attention. And we also teach you how to just be practical, right? You don't always have to try to remember everything in your head. So how can you be practical and efficient in your life? So these are the kinds of things that are shown to be effective in these studies. These are the kinds of things that we include in our memory training programs. Um, we also teach people how to apply these techniques outside of the classroom so that you can go and use them in, in daily life. And we like to teach this in small groups because we found, again, there is a sharing of knowledge. It's also socialization and it's fun. So some of those techniques would be associating. So we teach you, you know, if you hear the word Frank, what, can, what goes with that word? What other things has your brain stored and, and related to the word Frank? And let's capitalize on that to help your memory. We teach you how to remember faces and names. So how do you remember the name of your new neighbor or somebody you meet in a memory training class? We teach you how to set memory goals which comes right out of cognitive rehabilitation and also comes out of uh, corporate like trainings. How do you set goals, memory goals to get done what you wanna get done? And how to efficiently use practical strategies and techniques. So um, we have a couple of different courses. We have a four week course and we have an eight week course for people in residential care facilities. And, um, the four-week course is available digitally over Zoom, and it's also available in person, provided that we're not having a surge, right? So we have to put our finger in the wind in order to figure that one out, and we, we try to keep everyone safe here at UCLA. So, um, but we have not stopped during the pandemic uh, in providing these courses over Zoom. We have also shorter memory classes. So just an afternoon, for example, in our brain boot camps, And it's sort of a intensified program where you learn a couple of memory techniques and you learn some physical health and uh, strategies as well. So as I mentioned, all these programs are available virtually and um, we also have partners in the community that give these programs. So we license these programs out to organizations. And if you go on the Longevity Center website, let's say you want, you live in Culver City and you wanna see who's offering these courses near you, then you can find out who's in your neighborhood if you, if you want to take a class from somebody close to home. We have other lifelong learning activities here, including our webinars. And um, we try to cover kind of a gamut of, of topics. We've covered COVID, we've covered the aging brain and vision, and uh, we just covered something uh, along the lines of human evolution uh, the other day, female health across the tree of life. So 
we're always open to suggestions too. If you say, well, I think this is an important topic. I would like to see a webinar on it. You can send us an email. Can't promise that we'll do it. But um, again, if there's enough people that want to do it, we, we, we would probably do it. In, in uh, the rest of this year, we have a new program that um, we're making uh, improvements to our website. So when you see it, it's, it's rather under construction. And um, we also have a senior resource directory that we're putting together right now. And this is a guide for people over 50 to lifelong education, research, and fun events here on the UCLA campus. So it's, it's a one-stop shopping, we hope, for uh, stuff to do at UCLA. We're also expanding our uh, longevity center and we have an advisory board and we're looking to um, add to our advisory board. So these are, these are individuals who have, um, who have a background in anything from you know, community engagement to business, to health. And uh, if you wanna get involved in bringing programmatic changes and new ideas to the Longevity Center, that's a good way to do it. And we will always be happy to talk to you more about that. And uh, the Longevity Center really survives on donations. So we're funded through our programs and your donations support all of our programs here and including the existing programs and new programming and you could even fund uh, people can even fund research as well here so i'm i'm going to turn this over now to um andy who's going to talk in depth about our senior scholars program but i just want to again thank you for listening and um and just tell you that we have programs here that are beneficial to your health and wellness and all involved lifelong learning. So thanks very much. All right, can everyone hear me? Uh, before I start, I, we do wanna open up the floor if anyone has any questions for Dr. Erkley before right. she heads out, you're more than welcome. If you wanna raise your hand, I'll, I'll run a mic over to you. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, do you have any ongoing research? And if somebody was interested in participating as a research subject, um, how do you get involved? Yeah, we collaborate with uh, different researchers here at UCLA. So if you go to our website, you'll see some flyers. But de definitely Dr. Helen Lavretsky is doing a study right now called the Motion Study about the effects of physical exercise and cognitive stimulation on, on cognitive functioning. There is a study on um, transcranial magnetic stimulation for folks with memory problems, but they're also uh, recruiting uh, healthy adults. So this is through Dr. Suthana's lab. And we also work with the Easton Center, which is our uh, Alzheimer's disease, dementia through, uh, it's in the Department of Neurology. But if you click on the link, you can see, you can contact them and see what's going on there. So, yes. Any other questions? So somebody did ask uh, in Zoom, can we take language classes? And is that good for the brain? It absolutely is, um, but we don't, we don't, provide language classes here. If somebody wants to take a language class, they'd have to go to, for example, maybe a community college or uh, somewhere in the community or find, actually there are lots of language tutors out there too. You could even do an app. Yeah. Janet, do you want to, this is um, one of our volunteers, Janet Laver. On UCLA's extension or in their extension program, they offer quite a few language courses and at different levels at different semesters, but it's something through UCLA you can um, access. 
Thank you. Right. So UCLA Extension, they might have some at the Emeriti program too. So yeah. Somebody also said um, for the past several years, I can't remember a 10 digit phone number within seconds of seeing it or hearing it. And by changing my lifestyle or training, can this be changed at least up to a two minute uh, gap or delay in and will I be able to remember the number. So what we what you'll learn if you take a memory program is that it's just not going to stick if you see it, especially 10 digits. 10, digit, 10 digits, uh, a 10 digit number is too long for our brains to just absorb in one shot. So we teach people methods how to remember that phone number and you can compensate for that. But um, no, nobody's going to be able to just, unless they can already do it and have that gift. Anybody who can remember a 10 minute phone number just seeing it once, um, they should start a nightclub show and see if they can do this more. So that's a, it's not an easy thing to do in all seriousness, but we can teach you how to do it. Also, what about lifestyle change? Lifestyle change is something that's slow, right? So if you're drinking a lot of alcohol, you're smoking, that's the kind of stuff that when you stop, you're gonna see more immediate benefits. Uh, if you're gonna lower your cholesterol and your blood pressure, you're gonna see there are immediate benefits doing that, but you're, you're making a long-term investment in yourself, right? To not have a heart attack or stroke. And, and the same thing with substances, but what we know about substances is they can affect your cognition because they cross into the brain and essentially your body doesn't get rid of some of those toxins right away. So you need to get off of them and see how you feel when your mind is clear and not being affected by things like alcohol, drugs, et cetera. And I believe those are the questions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Erkley. Um, I will go ahead and step up here. Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Andy Telekowski. I am the coordinator, the program coordinator for the UCLA Longevity Center. And I've worked on senior scholars now for over three years. Um, this is my fourth open house, but it's the first time that we've been back in person in three years. And it's wonderful to see people here um, in the flesh. We have a nice group of folks as well who are joining us online, which really sums up how we're going about the program now. We are moving forward with a hybrid version. Those folks who feel comfortable coming to campus, following the COVID guidelines, we welcome your back. We're so pleased to have senior scholars back on campus um, after such a long break during COVID. Um, and we are continuing to offer all the online options that are available. So any folks who prefer to stay at home, who don't wanna make the commute, who just feel more comfortable. We even now have senior scholars who are joining us across the state and across the country who have an opportunity to audit classes at UCLA that they never had before. And we are gonna do our best to provide as many options as we can. So let's go ahead and take a peek at where we've been. So we started back in 1995 and we had five senior scholars auditing classes at UCLA and our program has certainly grown since then. Um, last year we had senior scholars audit over 400 classes at UCLA um, and we are just continuing to grow as we are able. Um, we are moving into the fall quarter and I'm gonna talk mostly about enrollment and the process of getting into senior scholars and getting approved. Now, senior scholars is eligible to any individual who's over 50 who is interested in joining. You do not have to be a UCLA alumni. Um, really our only requirement is age um, and everyone is welcome to apply whether that's in person or online. Um, and we do have an application process. Um, we are not picking and choosing. Everyone who fills out the application correctly and follows our guidelines is more than welcome. And right now we are enrolling for fall. So uh, this is the perfect time. We have about two weeks until our deadline. So you have time, all of you uh, in person have catalogs. Those folks who are online, you are more than welcome to go to our website, find our application, find the classes available. Um, as long as you fill out an application or give us a call by the 26th, 
uh, we will enroll you in fall. Instruction is going to begin the end of September. The 22nd is a Thursday. That's not an error. That is how UCLA functions for their fall quarter. They're welcoming in the freshman students the first couple of days of the week. Um, and we do allow scholars to you know, uh, move their schedule around a bit the first two weeks. So if you go to a class and it turns out it's not for you, you have two weeks to drop that class. We even sometimes are able to make adjustments to get you into a different course. Um, and you are able to get refunded. The majority of your course fees are able to make adjustments for you in those two weeks. After that, your schedule is set. Um, and then we run on the quarter system. So that's 10 weeks of instruction. So we'll be all done by December. So it's, it's a little quick, but if you look at it this way, it gives you opportunities to take more classes throughout the year, which is pretty nice. So let's go over our application process. I know some folks here have already been in the program. They've been through this. For those folks that are new, we'll just go over how you start within senior scholars. Um, before you fill out your application, you will want to know what class you would like to take. And we do have two options available to find those classes. We have the senior scholars catalog, which some of you are holding. This is a condensed catalog. We put it together so folks who don't feel as comfortable using um, the, the huge online undergraduate schedule of classes can easily flip through it and find a course. You know, we tend to pick courses of professors that we have had positive um, reviews from in the past, classes that are popular. But if you would like to look outside of that, you are more than welcome to go to the full schedule of classes. And the link to that is available on our website. It's available in the catalog as well. Any undergraduate lecture course is open to audit. We have a couple restrictions. And when you go to that full schedule of classes, you will see that there are lab courses, seminar courses, any of those courses that aren't labeled as a lecture, we actually cannot have senior scholars audit. These are small classes. They require high levels of participation not super appropriate if you're just supposed to, you know, if you're auditing, if you're just sitting and listening and learning. Um, that does unfortunately include language courses, and that's the most frequent question I get, but as Janet just pointed out, we have a lot of options here at UCLA through extension, um, through the OSHA program as well, that offer language courses. And then secondly, um, once you find your class, you're able to go ahead and submit your application. You can do that on our website, so we do have an online application. It's pretty straightforward, nothing too complicated. However, um, we know that some folks just prefer to register over the phone. That is absolutely fine. This number on the screen, that is to me. So if you ever have called the Senior Scholars Program in the past, you've talked to me on the phone. I take applications over the phone, it takes about five minutes. Um, and we do uh, charge a fee for the courses. So if you're interested in auditing one course, it's $175. If you're interested in auditing additional courses, it would be 150. So let's say you want to take two courses, that's going to be 325. We do offer scholarships for low income seniors. Um, we never want someone to not be able to take a class because of the any financial burden. Um, and you're more than welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions about that process. Once we receive your course request, then on my end, I reach out to all the professors to confirm you in your class. So we do not have classes that are pre-confirmed. We do have to ask each professor every quarter if they are um, willing to take senior scholars. And luckily we have a number of fantastic professors at UCLA who are very encouraging of our program. I would say 85 to 90% of the requests we put in get an enthusiastic yes. Every now and then, we do have professors either who have too many undergraduate students, they may be new professors, they may just not have the space or the time to accommodate auditors. And in that case, um, you know, we work with you to either find an alternate course, um, we make do. I would say that if you are not able to get your first choice class, which is very, very likely, we can always get you in your second choice. I think I've maybe had one or two instances where someone was left without any class by the beginning of the term, we normally are able to find you something that you will enjoy. Um, once we go through the process of getting those confirmations, we send you an email. That's when we're gonna get you all the information you need to audit. We are gonna send you the days, times, protocol, 
the professors will know you're coming in. Um, and so this happens for fall quarter all at the beginning of September. So if you submit an application now, don't worry if you don't hear from us for two weeks, this whole process is gonna start at the end of the month. And then of course, as well, we do get you access to the course website. This is very important. If you're auditing online, this will be your lifeline to the course. But it's nice as well, if you are in person, you get access to all of the materials that the students are getting. So this is handouts, any videos the professor wants you to watch. Um, we, do, we do not provide textbooks through the program. Um, that is one thing to know. Any, um, any books that are for purchase outside of the class, we do leave that up to the senior scholars whether or not they wish to buy them. Um, but all those materials on the, on the course website, those will be available to you. So we're gonna go over our program agreement really quickly. Um, and this is um, everything that we, we do ask of the senior scholars to remain in the program. So we ask that scholars do keep their personal opinions and beliefs out of the classroom. We do wanna respect the professors. Um, you know, um, we get that people are teaching um, things that are you know, across the board in terms of opinions and beliefs. Um, but we are here really mainly to listen and to learn. Um, and so we don't, we aren't looking to, um, for senior scholars to necessarily facilitate dialogue or conflict within the classroom. Um, that being said as well, um, the undergraduate students who are enrolled, they do get priority seating and they also get priority in terms of speaking within the class. Um, you know, we do want to acknowledge that they're here to get their degree. Um, and so we want to go ahead and give them, you know, the space they need, the seating. If anyone in terms of accommodations needs to sit closer or has um, particular needs in terms of seating, do reach out to me because we can always make an accommodation for that. Um, we leave it up to the instructors to determine the level of participation. We have professors who love to have the senior scholars share in class, especially if they have you know, um, a great example recently, um, I had a senior scholar in a World War II history class who had fought in the Battle of the Bulge, which was incredible. And so the professor actually had him come up and give a presentation um, and was very excited and very welcoming to have him speak. Um, other professors are really gonna focus the dialogue on the undergraduate students. And so they may ask you not to ask questions during class, just listen and learn. We defer to the individual instructors you know, expectations around classroom etiquette when it comes to speaking. But we generally ask that unless the professor makes it very clear that they would like you to be a full participant, um, to assume that role as auditor, um, to, to keep comments or questions either to the end of the class and make sure all the undergraduate students are able to speak first. Um, we also make a note, um, if you are on the online course, just to keep your microphone muted. And I know that we've been, Zooming now for some time, so all that etiquette has been established. But you know, especially when you have a Zoom classroom of a hundred students, if everyone has their mics on and you hear that background noise, it can be very distracting. So we ask you just make sure that that you know the sound is off. Finally, or not finally, uh, we also ask in terms of discussion sessions, laboratory sessions, and for professors' office hours. Those are intended for the enrolled students. Again, looking at areas where there is high participation um, and there needs to be a focus for the enrolled students. So senior scholars do not attend um, those sessions. However, I always encourage folks, if you are attending a class with multiple senior scholars, by all means, if you wanna create a discussion group of your own, if you wanna reach out and set a time where you meet for coffee after class or meet over Zoom, we highly encourage that. It's a great way to continue your learning. Um, as I mentioned, the program isn't responsible for any additional fees that includes books, um, as well as parking. And then we ask that you refrain from emailing the professor directly if you have a question. If you have any questions, whether it's about the program or the professor, just go ahead and email those towards me or send those towards me. Um, typically what happens is a professor will forward them to me anyways. Um, so just go ahead and reach out to me first. And then if appropriate, I can forward to the professor, I can answer it myself. And then lastly, for folks who are going to be auditing in person, uh, we do require that you follow the COVID-19 protocols that are set up by the campus. And we'll go over those in depth in a second. 
If you're auditing a virtual course, as I kind of mentioned before, we want to make sure we minimize background noise and disruptions. It's great to be able to take a courses from home. We do still want to bring, you know, some level of, of, of attention and respect to that space. So it can be very tempting, you know, if sitting in your living room, if people are making noise around you, if you're in a crowded space, you know, we ask to go ahead and find a more private space, keep your microphone muted. That way we aren't distracting the professor or the students. And then as well, if you are attending a live course, we do ask that you be on time. Um, first of all, it's a little distracting if folks are jumping in and out of the space, especially if it's a small class. As well, the professor, once they start lecturing, may not remember to check to let you in the room, the Zoom room. Um, and I've had that happen a couple of times where people have been logged out, they try to join five, 10 minutes late, and we don't want that to happen. In terms of in-person protocol, um, as you know, senior scholars are required to show proof of vaccination as well as a booster. Um, and that is the UCLA campus protocol. Um, so this is not just us who are held to this um, expectation. It is staff, it is faculty, it is all the students as well. And the good news is if you did attend today in person, we have already verified your vaccination. We have a little check mark next to your name. You do not need to do it in order to join in fall quarter, you are already set. Um, for those who are joining us online and they would like to take an in-person class, um, you feel free to reach out to me. We will schedule a time um, that we, we do check vaccinations over Zoom. Um, so we can do that very quick, very easy. As well, as of right now, the UCLA campus is requiring indoor masking. And again, that's of everybody. I've got mine on right now, and I'm, I'm very thankful for those folks who are attending here in person. You're wearing your masks as well. Um, there is as well a daily symptom survey. This is really helpful for the campus to basically monitor any guests, students, anyone on campus in terms of symptoms. It helps them track who potentially may have been exposed. Make sure you're not feeling sick that day. Um, there is a link to that that is sent out to all the registered uh, participants. So you will see that. Now, probably the question I get the most for in-person classes is about parking. Um, so there are several parking uh, garages across the UCLA campus. You are welcome to park in any that offer daily parking. Um, there are pay stations set up so you can go ahead um, at, the, at the entrance to each level. You can go ahead, same as most automated parking stations. Um, $3 an hour or $13 a day. I know that previously we have offered quarterly parking permits, but we have not for about three years now for some of our scholars who have been taking classes for a long time. Unfortunately, um, we were getting, um, you know, uh, what's, I'm having a tip of the tongue moment. Um, we're getting an exception and we're counted as students. Unfortunately, we do not have that anymore. However, we do have the daily parking available there's also in the catalog options in terms of public transit that will take you to the campus. And then finally, you know, we have you just, you pay, it takes all forms of payment. You'll put your ticket in your dashboard. Um, if you are parking um, with a disability placard, you are able to purchase um, parking for a reduced fee. I believe it's about $7 a day from any of these pay stations. And finally, this is my contact information. So any of the general senior scholars information will lead back to me. We have the email and the phone number up there. Um, I just wanna thank everyone for coming and we have quite a bit of time for questions. If anyone does, I see some online, but as well, we have our lovely volunteer, Janet, is gonna come over and, and bring a mic to you. Thank you. Do you have any idea about the timeline for the winter uh, senior scholars program when you might be opening that up for um, enrollment and, and when that would start? We do. So for winter quarter, we actually just set our schedule for winter and spring. We are going to start enrollment November 7th. So we're going to enroll the month of November for winter quarter. That winter quarter is going to start the first week of January, um, right after um, right after New Year's. I think they're starting actually a Wednesday of that week to give some people a couple of days to recover. But absolutely. Um, 
we typically start enrollment about two months um, and you can uh, before the quarter starts and you can see the specific dates are listed on our website. Is the external user library card valid uh, permanently or just for the current semester? It's a great question. Um, and that's a perk that um, is, is important to mention. So senior scholars are eligible to get a library card um, at UCLA. Um, the library card privileges are valid when you are a senior scholar. So um, if you are interested, if you do not have a library card yet and you would like to get one, you can walk into any UCLA library um, if you are enrolled for that quarter and say, I'm a senior scholar. And they will have a roster of senior scholars uh, who are active in that quarter and they will grant you a library card. And it's a great, um, it's a great resource to have. Um, you know, we have an extremely extensive collection here at UCLA. You can actually check out textbooks from there, um, save yourself a little bit of money. So. Um, yes, it's, it's, it is valid as long as you are a senior scholar. All right, I'm, where are the libraries? Um, you can see uh, we have a UCLA map in the uh, catalog. Um, there's an, I mean, we've got quite a few. Um, you know, the one that folks usually uh, see the most often is Powell Library, and that's available kind of in the UCLA quad area, but they have um, an arts library. Um, they've got a beautiful law library, if you've ever been there before. Um, probably, I think, eight or nine different buildings across UCLA, all with um, a lot of them have specific focuses. So um, you can see it on the, on the map. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm just going to, I'll be just repeating any questions just so folks on the um, on the Zoom can hear. So the question was if catalogs are going to be online or they're printed. We have printed catalogs available here at the Senior Scholars Open House that we're handing out. Um, for anyone who's online, it is available on our website. Um, and so you can find it, you can find it there. Um, we have one more question. We'll give, we'll give a second. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. We'll get to get to you in a second. Let's give Janet a second to, <laughs> thank you, Janet. Thank you. What is the difference between the Senior Scholars Program and OSHA? That's a great question. Um, so for those of you who have not heard of the OSHA program before, that is another educational program here at UCLA that is catered to older adults. The main difference between us and OSHA is that OSHA runs their own classes. So OSHA creates their own schedule, they hire their own instructors, and all the individuals in that class will be over the age of, I believe, 50 or 60. I don't know what their age cutoff is. Um, so what I recommend, it's a great program if you like to be registered as a full participant. Um, the, the Senior Scholars Program, you are in the actual UCLA undergraduate classrooms. So you will get a more extensive catalog um, and you will be sitting with the undergraduates, which some senior scholars love. They like that intergenerational connection. The difference though, is that you aren't registered as a full participant, you are an auditor. Um, and so um, it's, it's, it's very dependent on what type of experience you prefer. But OSHA is a fantastic program. We have a lot of folks who take both, who will enroll in OSHA and will enroll in senior scholars. Um, it just depends on what topic you're looking for and what experience you want within the classroom. Um, OSHER, it's O-S-H-E-R. Yes, and we have, we have one question over here towards the front. A assisted hearing? Um, it's a good question. Typically in larger lecture halls, the professors will have microphones. Um, in smaller classrooms, however, they won't. Um, we have inquired about getting assistive hearing devices for senior scholars through campus resources, but since they are not considered fully registered students, we haven't been able to. Um, so typically, if someone does um, need assistance in terms of hearing, you know, we ask that if they have any, um, you know, adaptive aids they would, you know, they would like to wear, whatever 
they have on them they can bring. And then I will talk to the, um, I usually typically can talk to the instructor as well to see if we can get those folks sitting a little closer to the front. So they have the visual and they can they can hear better. So we basically we make it work on a case by case basis, but anyone who does need those accommodations, just um, by all means, just reach out to me and, and we will work something out between us and the instructor. All right, I wanna go ahead and just check on our online questions because we have some folks who are asking, let's see. Someone asked, how do we get on your mailing list? Very easy, the email that you see on the screen, you are more than welcome to reach out. Um, so you can see there's actually as well, all of our information is available on our website if you want to be added to our mailing list. We only send out reminders about our upcoming classes. We're not gonna send you a bunch of information you don't want. It's just reminders about senior scholars enrollment dates, if you'd like to be on the Longevity Center email list, we send reminders about all of the memory programs that Dr. Oakley mentioned as well as our webinars and that is it. Um, good question from Joan, which is that, um, can you audit any classes in the law school or MBA program? Uh, we typically do not have senior scholars audit graduate courses. In the few instances that I have had senior scholars audit graduate courses, it tends to be because they know the instructor personally. And if an instructor comes to me and says, I would like this person to join my class, absolutely we will. Um, the law program actually is on a semester schedule. So they kind of operate entirely differently. Our, our application process doesn't accommodate their timeline. They start classes when we're still in, the, in enrolling. Um, and so I have not had any scholars um, take classes through the law school or, or through the MBA program as well. Um, I had a folk, uh, someone ask, can you attend on campus and also Zoom the same class? Occasionally those options are available and you can tell what those options are if you go ahead and look on the schedule of classes. If a class is listed as, that has an in-person um, location and it is also labeled as recorded, then you will have both options. Unfortunately, I haven't seen any that have been labeled as such for fall quarter. It seems either it's going to be exclusively online or in person. Um, but if you do see that in the future, that is, um, that is, you have to look, see if it's recorded and if it has an in-person location listed. And then as well, we have a question. Today's uh, video will be available um, if you would like to view it at any other time. For anyone who joined late or for anyone who's joining us online, um, you are more than welcome. And we will have this available on our website. Um, and it, this is a great question. Um, is it a good idea to take a course you took over 30 years ago? Um, and you know, I, I have had senior scholars who are UCLA alumni who came in and took a class that they had already taken. <laughs> And usually the good news is, um, and you would hope that a course you took 30 years ago that the curriculum has changed. Um, and typically it has, it's been updated. Um, I've had scholars take classes that their um, children or grandchildren have taken at UCLA. Or you know, a common, a common comment that I get from senior scholars is they may have studied a, a particular topic in their undergraduate years and came back and taken the same topic at UCLA and it's completely different. Um, and so absolutely, I have scholars who took a course they took three years ago and still enjoyed it just as much. So um, I would say if it is a topic you're interested in and you'd like to retake it, whether it was taken you know, decades ago or more recently, absolutely. Um, okay, I have any other, any folks who are joining us online, you're welcome to drop more questions in the Q&A. We've answered almost all of them for now. And I just want to go ahead and give the in-person crew a chance if anyone has a question. One more question, absolutely. Um, you mentioned giving priority seating to the students. Mm -hmm. So how does, what is that? Uh, that's probably a dumb question, but does that mean that we need to like wait until everyone gets in the room and then sit down or how does that work? Yeah, typically what I ask is, um, you know, to leave seats in the front 
to uh, the undergraduates. Um, so let's say if this is our classroom and you were a senior scholar, I'd say looking from kind of like the, the back half of the room would be a great place to sit. In most of the classes, we'll find that um, there's a decent number of empty seats um, because you will have a class where technically 100 undergraduates are enrolled in and you maybe will get 70 who attend every class. Um, you know, uh, I would say in classrooms that are very small in which you have seating of maybe 20 to 30 students, sometimes it's always best to ask the instructor, you know, who will be there, hey, is there a good place for me to sit, um, to sit, you know, further to the back of the side. Again, if you do need accommodations, let me know, because we can work that out beforehand. Um, but yeah, to be, you don't have to wait until every single person's come in. Um, but you can, you can kind of generally see, okay, what are the seat, the seats that are going to be you know, if someone wants to ask questions or engage, where do they want to sit kind of up here and leave these seats around here for me. Yeah. All right, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, we still have a little bit of time. You're more than welcome for our folks in person. If you would like to step outside, there's a courtyard to the side. If you would like to mingle for a bit, I will be here at the table in the front um, answering any you know, specific questions you have or you'd like to come to say hi. Um, I really appreciate everyone being here. It's really nice to see our senior scholars faces again. Um, and absolutely take care. Thank you for coming today, everybody. Thank you so much. And thanks to um, Andy and Janet and Nazali and Ernie up there in the booth for putting this all together. So yeah, we're here and any questions that come up once you leave, just feel free to email. Thank you again. Have a great day, everyone.